you are here for the last talk of the day. Using undocumented CPU behavior to see into kernel mode and break KSLR in the process. Uh, put on by Anders Foe and Daniel Gruss. Anders, Daniel, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, this talk is about using undocumented CPU behavior to see into kernel mode and break KSLR in the process. Um, about a year ago, I was preparing a talk for Black Hat 2015 about detecting row hammer. Uh, when Daniel and his team came up with the way to do Rohammer in JavaScript, uh, that marked the first time that Daniel's and my research collided. Uh, it has collided a lot the last year, and finally we decided that it might be a good idea to cooperate instead of competing. And what you're about to see here is uh, the first result of our cooperation, and I hope you like it. So before we actually start with the presentation, I'm just the a couple of things to set straight. This talk is about a class of microarchitectural attacks. It's um, not about software bugs. Um, it is, however, about how CPU des design can be used as an attack vector. And um, with microarchitectural attack, we mean it's not about the instruction set architecture, which is what Intel promises to software developers that it will keep. It's about how the instruction set architecture is implemented, that is the level below that. Um, we will be focusing on Intel x86-64. Uh, lots of the stuff that we'll be doing applies to other architectures as well. Uh, so, um, what we want you to take away from this talk is on a macro level that CPU design is security relevant and on the micro level we'll want to make clear that the prefetch instruction leaks important information and that we can use this information to locate a driver in kernel mode, that is defeat KRSLR, and we can translate virtual addresses to physical addresses and we can use this for other attacks. So this is a short overview of the organization of this talk. I will not read this slide out aloud, so I'll spare you that. Um, turning to the introduction, uh, we found something in an Intel manual that read something like this. Uh, using the prefetch instruction is recommended only if data does not fit in the cache. Use of software prefetch should be limited to memory addresses that are managed or owned within the application context. Prefetching the address that are not mapped to physical pages can experience non-deterministic performance penalty. For example, specifying a null pointer as, a, as an address for a prefetch can cause long delays. Um, what somebody like Daniel reads when he sees this is, please, only use the prefetch as Intel intends or else Intel will be angry and there is no reason why anybody would measure the execution time. Um, so, short who am I? My name is Anders Fock. I'm a principal security researcher for G-Data Advanced Analytics. I've been playing with malware since 1992 and you can reach me on Twitter or by email. Hello from my side, uh, my name is Daniel Gruss and I'm a PhD student from Graz University of Technology where we have also uh, worked on this project. Um, later on recently I joined Microsoft to do an internship in Cambridge UK. You can also reach me on Twitter or via email. Uh, yeah. Um, so this was a joint work with uh, some other researchers from TU Graz. Clementine Maurice, Moritz Lipp and Stefan Mangard who are unfortunately not here uh, but it was a uh, group collaboration and team effort. Okay, let's start right away with some background on the memory subsystem. So for the first part uh, we want to talk about CPU caches, how CPU caches work. Um, you have relatively fast CPU nowadays in your computer but the uh, DRAM is still very slow. Uh, because that's how DRAM works and uh, there is some idea to, to make the accesses to your memory faster because you need a lot of memory but only need a small fraction of the memory uh, in a high frequency. Uh, the idea is to buffer the frequently used memory in the CPU in some smaller but faster memory locations. Every memory reference that any program in your system does goes through the cache usually and it will be fast because it's buffered in the cache. 
the cache is entirely transparent to the operating system and programs. So you won't notice that the, uh, that the address is actually cached, uh, except for one uh, artifact. And that is the access latency. So if you measure the execution time of a memory uh, operation, then you will see that the access latency for a cache hit is much smaller than for a cache miss. And here you see that for this particular CPU, uh, the cache hits were around 70 cycles, whereas the cache misses were around 220 cycles most of the time. If we look at the structure of caches in modern CPUs in detail. Uh, today you have CPUs with multiple cores and each of those cores has private caches, the level one and the level two caches, and they all together have one big shared cache, the last level cache, the level three cache, which is up to several megabytes. And the small caches, the level one cache for instance, is, it is only like 32 kilobytes of data cache and 32 kilobytes of instruction cache. And there is a reason for that and this is that you uh, want to work with virtual addresses here. The level two cache is larger and also the last level cache is larger. There you have to work with physical indexes to find the right location in the cache um, and the, the right cache set to store the data that you want to load from DRAM. There is a fixed mapping from physical addresses to locations in the cache. And this, ca yeah, and this mapping, this is fixed in the CPU. Uh, so if you have one memory location, it will always go to the same memory location in the cache. There are two operations basically to manipulate the uh, cache utilization, uh, to optimize the cache usage. That is first the prefetch instruction. Uh, it is sort of a hint to the CPU where you can tell the CPU, please load this into the cache. I think I might need this in the near future. Uh, and there is the CL flush instruction which basically does the counterpart. Uh, it tells the CPU, I don't need this part, throw it out of the cache or rather uh, for coherency reasons, you can also use the CL flush instruction to, set, to tell the CPU, uh, I'm not sure this value in the CPU is still up to date, please flush it to the memory and then reload it from the memory on the next access. Both instructions are based on virtual addresses, so they need to perform somehow this translation from virtual addresses to physical addresses because the last level cache is physically indexed. You can remember that for later because we might need that later on. When we talk about prefetch instructions, actually there are five prefetch instructions. Uh, first we have the uh, prefetch T0 to T2, uh, which give different sort of hints um, where the data should be loaded. And as a, as a rule for the sum, you can, uh, you can say that the T2 instruction will fetch it rather to the level three cache, whereas the T0 instruction will rather fetch it to a cache that is closer to the execution core. The prefetch NTA instruction allows you to tell the CPU, okay, I will probably only access this data once, you can throw it away afterwards, but please load it into the cache right now. And then there is a prefetch W instruction which tells, which tells the CPU, uh, yeah, I'm intending to write to this variable, maybe, but uh, I'm not, yeah, could you please load it into the cache, into my local cache, and maybe invalidate it for the other caches so that I can really write to it without any delay. The actual behavior of the prefetch instruction varies widely between the different CPU models, so whether T0 fetches to L3 and L1 or L3 and L2 and L1. Uh, so you cannot really re rely on a specific behavior, but we found out that this is also not necessary because we are just interested in some corner cases. The prefetch instructions, they are somewhat usual. Uh, not only that they have to translate virtual to physical addresses, uh, they are unusual in, in two ways. The first, I already said they are hints, so the CPU can ignore them, but most of the time the CPU will not ignore them. Um, the second unusual property is that it is probably one of the, one of the um, few instructions in the uh, Intel manual where it says this instruction does not perform any privilege checks and it does not cause any exceptions. 
And if you read anything in the Intel manual and it says uh, it does not cause any exceptions, then this sounds a bit uh, dangerous. So, why do we actually have this address translation with the virtual and physical addresses? If we look back, back uh, 20 or 30 years, or if we look at small embedded platforms, we actually don't have virtual addresses, we only have physical addresses and you can only run like one program, one system on, on, on this chip and you don't have any isolation between different, uh, between different threads on this CPU. Um, with the um, Intel 3, 386 CPU, uh, virtual addresses have been introduced and they allow to isolate uh, different, different processes on the same CPU by providing different address spaces to them. So there is a map inside your hardware and you can configure this map and you can map from virtual addresses like the pointers that you usually have in your programs to real physical addresses on the hardware. Every application has its own virtual address space because it has its own map from virtual to physical memory. In this map, you don't, uh, you not only have the translation from virtual memory to physical memory, but you also have uh, the privilege settings for this memory region. And the privileges are then checked when you access a, mem a memory address in this memory range. The privileges are then managed by the operating system kernel, so you can do this dynamically and the operating system can manage what you may and may not access. For instance, you should not be able to access the kernel the address translation on x86 looks like this. So we have a four stage translation. It looks more complicated than it actually is because it does the same on ev all of the four levels. So you start on the top left corner with the CR3 register which is a CPU register and it gives you the physical base address of your translation tables. Uh, and it's, it's in this case uh, the PML4, the page map level four. And this page map level four has 512 entries. Every of those tables here has 512 entries and each entry is eight bytes in size to store a 64 bit point time basically and therefore you, each of those tables is four kilobytes in size which is again pretty nice because you have four kilobyte pages on Intel CPUs and then it's easy to organize all the memory with a bitmap. Uh, the virtual address, so we have a 48 bit virtual address here and so yeah, we know we have 64 bit address space, but right now we can only use 48 bits and it's divided into different parts. So we have the first part is the uh, page map level four index and this index has nine bits and it chooses the right page map level for entry from, from this first uh, table. Then exactly the same happens on this, on the next level, the page directory pointer table. Each of those page directory pointer table entries organizes one gigabyte of your virtual memory. And here you have the option to directly map a one gigabyte page to physical memory or you can map a page directory and this page directory will divide the one gigabyte page into smaller blocks. The page directory then again has 512 entries so you have two megabyte pages that you can map in the page directory and on the last level the page table uh, you, get, you again have 512 entries and then it divides the two megabyte page into four kilobyte pages. Now these tables are quite large. They are multiple kilobytes, each, each of them at least four kilobytes and you have multiple tables per layer so you will probably have one PML4 and multiple PDPTs and multiple page directories. So this adds up and you have several kilobytes of physical memory that is actually used to translate uh, virtual addresses to physical addresses. So this is kind of weird to access physical memory, you need to access physical memory to translate your virtual addresses to physical addresses. This is kind of weird and this would also be very slow and therefore Intel had the idea to uh, introduce caches for this part as well. So here we again have a cache hierarchy similar to the level one, level two, level three caches and it starts with the instruction TLB and the data TLB on the top and then we go next to the page directory entry cache, the page directory pointer entry cache and then the PML4 e cache. The CPU starts the lookup on the top so it first checks whether there is an entry in the TLB and if it is it can already abort and uh, get the data from the cache. 
or from the DRAM. If there is no such entry, it probably has to go further down on the lookup hierarchy and if it doesn't find any entry in any cache, then it has to look up the page table structures in the system memory in the DRAM. So um, before we can proceed with an attack, we need to know about how modern operating system uses this paging system. And um, the first thing we need to talk about is um, that the kernel is mapped in each and every process on the system. Uh, this is by necessity. Uh, it turns out that user applications often use kernel services like reading from a hard disk or stuff like that. And for that it calls into the kernel where a privilege escalation is being made and then uh, and, uh, and the stack is being changed. So this means that the kernel is present in every user mode application. Uh, however, it typically protects itself from access using the page tables. Um, uh, for this talk, we also need to talk about address space uh, layout randomization. Um, in this case, it means that the kernel and the drivers are loaded at random offsets in virtual memory. And the idea behind this is that it mitigate code reuse attacks such as uh, return objective programming. There are other code reuse attacks that are mitigated with this method as well. Um, it also mitigates attack based on read primitives or write primitives. And that is the classical ex exploits. Um, and the idea here is that if an attacker does not know where in memory uh, the code or, or the data that he needs to use is, then he is unable to, to mount an attack. Uh, what however can happen is that if a kernel or a driver address is being leaked, uh, it defeats the mitigation. Uh, the final thing that we need to talk about is uh, the kernel direct physical map. It's not present on all operating systems, but it's on many operating systems. And the kernel physical map is, uh, direct physical map is, uh, means that the entire physical memory is mapped into the kernel space. And the reason is probably convenience because this allows the kernel to change any memory at any time for any reason. Um, and um, this is without changing the page tables or doing stuff like that. So it's convenient and it speeds things up. It is not on all operating system. It's available on OS X, it's available on Linux, it's available on BSD. And quite interesting, it's available on Send PVM, that means Amazon EC2. Um, it's not available on Windows. Uh, we should take note of this because uh, one of our attacks actually uses this uh, kernel direct physical map. Um, so that moves us on to actually talking about uh, the side channel that we're using for our attack, the prefetch side channel. And before we go ahead, we just summarize what we had thus far. Uh, first, the kernel is mapped into every process. Two, the prefetch instruction takes a virtual address as input. To manipulate the L3, a physical address is needed. The prefetch instruction must translate. Three, the prefetch instruction does not track privileges, meaning any address can be prefetched. And four, translation is cached. And lookup searches, caches, in a fixed order. Uh, this leads to the question, caches are supposed to speed things up. Can we figure out the order uh, where the lookup succeeds or fails? Uh, by a timing attack, and we can actually measure a difference. And when we do that, it looks like this. And if you remember the cache lookup hierarchy graph, you will find that this is an almost exactly match of what you would expect when measuring latency on the prefetch instructions. Um, that the fastest is if it's in the TLB, and the slowest if it has to go to physical memory. Uh, it's worth noting here that that is exactly the reversed order of the page table lookup itself. And that has a purpose uh, for Intel because most operating system tends to use small pages, not much used for gigabyte pages in real world applications. Um, so the idea here is, would this also work for inaccessible kernel memory? And you already know the answer because uh, the prefetch instruction doesn't check privileges. So let's turn to what we can do with the kernel with the pre prefetch instruction. Um, before we actually do an attack, we need to define an at attack primitive, and we call this our translation oracle, and it works by timing the prefetch instruction on an arbitrary address, and it will recover the translation 
level. Uh, how this works is we time the prefetch instruction. The time that we get out of that, we match to the uh, diagram you saw in the last frame. Um, it's fairly simple. You start at the y-axis, you end up at the x-axis, and you'll see where you, uh, you get. Um, we can use this to recover a map of the kernel. And uh, what do I mean by map of the kernel? Most of you probably know the proc pit page map in Linux, uh, which is nowadays privileged to access because it's useful for attacks. Um, remember, our attack is a CPU-based attack. It's not about an operating system. This means that we can recover this map for Windows as well. We can recover it for other operating systems. It's just that we can recover it from basically most any operating system from unprivileged uh, code execution because the prefetch instruction is unprivileged. Um, so we start out with a breath with searched, uh, and that is we search the memory for PML4 entries, and we do this by uh, searching in half terabyte steps. Remember, this is half a terabyte uh, uh, cache. Um, and if we find one, we know we, that we can, uh, when, whenever we find one, we know we can skip the next half gigabyte. And we do this for each of the four translation levels, and we end up with a complete map of the kernel. And to complete this process, it takes anywhere from seconds to hours, depending on how many pages are actually mapped by the operating system and what kind of pages there are. Um, typically, what you'll have is um, a lot of 4K pages. Um, the amount of time you need increases with stuff like uh, shared memory. If your memory map the same file a million times, you'll have a lot of page entries and it'll take a long time. Uh, however, at this point we should probably note that an attacker rarely needs a map of the entire kernel. He is usually satisfied with a very small subset of the kernel. So typically we can, he can, is able to run this attack in, in seconds or less. Uh, we will actually see this in uh, one of our case studies later. So the, uh, that's lead us to the next attack primitive that we have. And we call this the address translation oracle. The address translation oracle is there to uh, determine whether a virtual address, P, and another virtual address, P bar, map to the same physical address. Um, and the way this works is that we first flush P from the cache. Um, the seal flush instruction actually does cause access violations. This means that this has to be a user mode address where we have access. Um, the second step is we use the prefetch instruction to load p bar into the cache. And um, we remember the prefetch instruction doesn't check privileges, meaning that p bar can be a kernel mode address. And then we time the access of accessing p. And if accessing p is fast, we know that p maps to the same physical memory as p bar. Um, one should be aware here, prefetched instruction is a hint. That means that the reverse is not true. If it was slow, it does not mean that they do not map to the same physical memory as, as p bar. Uh, so just be aware of that this can occur. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, when we speak about measuring the execution time of instructions, we actually um, have to know how the Intel CPUs, modern in Intel CPUs, execute instructions. And they don't necessarily do that in order. They reorder instructions to optimize the execution flow. And if we look at a simple example with uh, like uh, three different instructions and we want to measure the middle instructions with uh, RDTSCP, then the CPU is actually allowed to reorder the instructions like this. So instruction two may be executed before the RDTSCP and instruction three may also be reordered to be executed in between or even before. And this is really bad because uh, then we don't know what we actually measured. We measured something but probably not what we wanted. Um, fortunately, the RDTSCP instruction provides us with a different property. So if we uh, look at reordering in the opposite direction, in the forward direction, then we see that instruction one may not be reordered so that it is between the two RDTSCPs and also instruction two 
uh, may not be reordered so that it's outside of the two RDT CPs. The same properties hold for uh, mFence. mFence is used to serialize memory accesses and here the same properties hold so the instructions may not be uh, the memory referencing instructions may not be reordered um, in, in the forward direction but it, they may be re, uh, reordered in the backward direction. So this is not allowed. Um, so we need some additional instruction that provides full serialization of our instruction sequence and actually there is uh, an instruction that allows us to do that uh, and that is CPU ID. So we have to, uh, to, to run CPU ID before and after the instruction that we want to measure uh, with a high cycle accuracy. Now CPU ID is a, is a instruction with a huge overhead and we observed uh, noise while we, we measured um, different instructions when using CPU ID so we had to figure a way to make the measurements really reliable. Uh, if we look at the prefetch instruction, the prefetch instruction is not ordered with respect to RDT SCP so this is allowed and this is also allowed so with when we want to measure prefetch RDT SCP is not a help at all and the same goes for mFence so again uh, it may be reordered in any direction and we cannot just rely on RDT SCP and mFence. So if we want to measure uh, the execution time of a prefetch instruction uh, we actually have to come up with a sequence and we came up with the following sequence. We start with an mFence to serialize memory accesses, then RDT SCP, then CPU ID, then the target instruction and then the same instructions in the, in the opposite order. And this allows us uh, that the prefetch instruction in the middle may actually be measured to a uh, high cycle accuracy. The CPU ID instruction might introduce noise, we have observed that, uh, but the noise should cancel out over several measurements. If we want to reduce the noise from CPU ID instead and if we don't measure a prefetch instruction uh, then we can instead execute the following sequence so mFence then CPU ID and then RDT SCP and this will provide us with a better accuracy so we don't have to perform that many measurements for this kind of measurement. When we measure the execution time of the prefetch instruction we use prefetch NTA or prefetch T2 because they target the last level cache uh, mainly and for the memory accesses we just use a move instruction um, as, as is used for most memory accesses. Yeah, next we talk about the feeding Windows 7K as along. So here is a case study in how we can actually mount an attack with uh, what we got so far. And um, first we need to notice that Windows 7 memory layout is, uh, is pretty fixed. We know that the hell and the kernel is always located between the addresses where it says start and end and for kernel drivers is located in, in another region. Uh, where they actually start is randomized but uh, they are in these regions. Um, this means that when we want to launch a, a recovery attack we only need to do a fraction of the kernel which means that we can actually mount this in less than a second. And this is actually how we start to break KSLR uh, on, on Windows 7. We map the driver's address space and use translation recovery attack. Remember we haven't broken Windows 7 KSLR until we know where a driver is in, in the memory because otherwise we would not know where there is something that an attacker could use. Um, the second step is we evict the page translation caches and um, there are two different ways that we can do this. We can use a sleep, uh, the sleep API in Windows which um, causes the process, current process to be sweat, uh, to be swapped out and another process swapped in and when we get swapped back in by the uh, scheduler uh, typically we'll see that the translation caching has, has been cleared and, uh, and we can use that. Another and faster way that we can do this is we can access a lot of memory in a large otherwise irrelevant buffer and since we're accessing a lot of memory it will be optimal for the CPU to have these addresses in the translation caches and this means that uh, all the kernel modules and drivers will uh, be removed from these caches. Uh, the third step we need is we need to perform a syscall to the targeted driver. 
What we are hoping to accomplish with that is that we hope the address addresses that is used by this targeted driver will be placed in the translation caches, in the paste translation caches, and that we can measure it afterwards, and that is, in fact, step four. Uh, in step four, we take an address from the list we found in, in the first step from the uh, page translation, that is where memory is actually mapped, and we time the prefetch for that. And we do that for all pages that we found in the first step, and the fastest average access time is then the right as address. There's a bit of noise in here, so we actually repeat these uh, five steps a hundred times to get a, an average. And um, when we look at that graphically, it looks something like this. And you'll notice here that the red bar is the address that we were looking for in a driver. And the very small blue dot uh, below signifies that this is the uh, smallest average here. Um, and in this way, we can locate a driver in, in physical, in, in virtual memory uh, for an unprivileged access using just the prefetch instruction. Okay. Um, then we will discuss how we exploit direct physical maps. And therefore, we will just go one step back first. So why uh, is the direct physical map a problem? Uh, let's think of uh, kernels like 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, assume that you have like a write for primitive and you can overwrite an address in the kernel. You could, for instance, overwrite some return address and then the uh, kernel would execute uh, user code. If you write a user code pointer there, the, you are still running in privile with privilege uh, in with privilege mode in ring zero. So if you just overwrite the return address with the user space code address, then you would actually run the user code. If this is for some reason not possible, you could still try to overwrite the stack pointer and then switch to a user space stack and then uh, do some return oriented programming uh, by uh, providing a nice prepared stack in the user space. Now this is not possible on modern CPUs anymore because there are countermeasures against that. Uh, the first is called supervisor mode execution prevention. So we cannot jump to user space code anymore because the hardware prevents that. The operating system uh, configures that and then the hardware prevents us from jumping there. And the same goes for switching to a user space stack. So we cannot simply uh, do that because supervisor mode access prevention prevents us from doing that. Now, in 2014, there has been an attack uh, showing that the identity mapping, the direct physical map in the kernel can be exploited to do the same, uh, to launch the same attack. Because every address that is valid in our user space program will also be in some accessible uh, region in the kernel memory, in this direct physical map. So instead of just jumping to the user space, we just take the physical address at the base offset of the direct physical map and jump there. And this is known as return to direct attacks and this was presented by Kemalis et al at Black Hat and Usenix in 2014. So what is the solution against those attacks? So they uh, suggested one solution that involved um, getting, getting rid of parts of the direct physical map, like the parts that are mapped in the user space binary. But actually, Windows doesn't have a direct physical map, so why don't we just get rid of the direct phys physical map in OS X and Linux and uh, other operating systems as, as well? That might be a solution, right? Apparently not, it's too complicated. Uh, instead, we decided we do not leak uh, physical addresses to the user. So you cannot access the physical address map anymore, and this is the solution. Perfect, problem solved. So what we can do now is we can circumvent this mitigation because it's not really a, a good mitigation, uh, and we can determine physical addresses or direct physical map addresses using prefetch. So we use our translation recovery tag to find the direct physical map if we don't know where it is, if, it would, if the base offset would be randomized. Usually it is not, so we can skip this step and just do the second step right away. So we uh, will search for a address in the direct physical map that we prefetch, and then we access our user space address and we will observe a cache hit. And when we do that, 
we will actually find that this is a very straightforward attack. Um, so it didn't take me much time to get this running. Uh, and I also talked to other people who reproduced this in a very short time. So you just iterate over the direct physical map and it just drops you the um, direct physical map address that is the maps to the same physical location. So this is great because this immediately leaks our address that we can exploit in a red to deer like attack and we don't need an additional information leak. We don't need the physical addresses but if we know the base offset of the direct physical map then we also have the physical address and knowing the physical address we can use the later on for other attacks. And as we already heard earlier we have direct physical maps in different operating systems so our attack works on Linux, on OS X, it works on Xen PVM. We tried that on Amazon EC2. Uh, that was fun. So you get sort of uh, direct uh, physical direct map uh, addresses of the Xen hypervisor because uh, the yeah the, the Xen hypervisor runs in ring zero and yeah then have fun with doing something with the physical address on Amazon. Um, our attack does not work on Windows because it doesn't, they don't have a direct physical map but it's still fun to play with the other operating systems. So let's talk about uh, using the physical address for other attacks and as you have heard earlier in this talk uh, the cache, the level 3 cache is physically indexed so you need the physical address to actually compute where an, a data is stored in the last level cache. And if you have this information you can use this to build a powerful side channel. So we have seen side channels to infer user input like single keystrokes. Uh, some, sometimes you can even narrow it down to the, uh, to the letter that has been uh, entered. Uh, we have seen crypto key recovery in like one encryption of 97% the, the of, the, of the key bits recovered. Uh, we have seen cross VM attacks, cross core attacks, even cross CPU attacks um, this year. We have seen attacks on any architecture so most of most attacks were on Intel architectures but there is a Usenix paper by us at uh, Usenix uh, this year and there we show that it works on ARM based mobile devices. That's also fun. Um, but for these attacks it really helps if you know the physical address because there is a mapping from physical addresses to the cache slices, the last level cache slices. Uh, and this function has been reverse engineered so we can use the function if we have the physical address but usually we, we wouldn't have the physical address in the first place. Another attack that, uh, that can benefit from knowing the physical address is row hammer. So if you know the physical addresses for a row hammer attack you can actually craft a, a much a more efficient attack. Uh, for those of you who don't know Rowhammer, it is basically a bug in hardware uh, where you access memory locations in a high frequency and at a different random memory location that you probably cannot access um, a bit flips and you can exploit that. It has been shown by Seaborn and Dulian who have presented this last year at Black Hat. Uh, you can gain root privileges, root privileges with that. So Rowhammer is pretty much like uh, slamming a door repeatedly to break into a neighbor apartment. That is how motherboard Vice described it when we presented Rowhammer in JavaScript uh, last year. Um, so it works pretty much like this. So you activate one row and then you activate another row and they are always copied to the row buffer and if you do that in a high frequency and often enough you will see bit flips in the row between those two. Uh, rows that you actually access. Now to actually do this you need to know uh, which memory locations, which, which physical addresses map to these two rows and therefore we need to know how the DRAM is organized and if you look at a modern system you probably will have multiple channels that are, that are the modules that you have in your system and each of those modules will probably have multiple sites that are the ranks of the, uh, of the DRAM module and then each chip is further divided into banks so you have up to eight banks or you, you have definitely eight banks on DDR3 and you have up to 16 banks in uh, DDR4 and these banks are further divided into the rows that you actually want to access. So you need to know the mapping from physical addresses to channel to rank to bank and then you can access memory locations in the same row. So why does actually uh, the bit flip uh, happen here? 
um, DRAM cells lose their charge over time. They leak the charge and if you let them leak the charge long enough they would lose the value that they stored. So you need to refresh the value that is stored in the, in, in the cell uh, very frequently and this is done by just reading the value from the row and writing it back. If you don't do this fast enough then you will have um, data errors, you will have bit flips. Now it has been found with uh, when when researching the uh, row hammer bug it has been found that proximate accesses can uh, increase the probability of a bit flip and this is the reason for this is that the cells leak faster upon uh, proximate accesses. We have reverse engineered the mappings from physical addresses to uh, memory to, to the actual uh, channel rank and bank and this is also a Usenext paper this year and we need the physical addresses then to compute where we want to hammer. Okay. So just to summarize, uh, with the direct physical map we are able to defeat uh, SMAP and SMAP and we are able to leak physical addresses and with these physical addresses we are able to perform other attacks specifically cache attacks and row hammer attacks. Um, this uh, leads us to our final slide and uh, what we got here is what we hope to bring across here is that CPU design is security relevant uh, in specific that prefetch leaks significant information information that we get here we can use to locate a driver in the kernel and thus break KRSLR. Uh, but that's not the only thing that we do. We can break SMAP and SMIP and we can get physical addresses to assist in other attacks. Uh, that was our talk I think. Uh, thank you. I've got a question for you. So if I understand correctly, you need to be able to read your own processes page tables in order to know what addresses are safe to search for the kernel mapping without causing a page fault. Is, is that correct? Uh, the prefetch instruction doesn't cause page faults, yeah. But, but you said earlier that um, you can only search pages, uh, I, I forget which of your You can only tables. search for, for memory locations that are actually mapped, yeah. You, the, all pages that are not mapped yet that would still require a page fault to occur, uh, you cannot, you find them as not mapped. So it's not valid. So do you need to know your own page table mapping before you can start searching for those one terabyte chunks or no? Oh no, no. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you.